Welcome to Another Dose, the GEMS podcast where EMS meets ED to talk about trending topics in emergency medical services. I'm Dr. Candace McDonald. And I'm Robin Goldinger. We'd like to welcome you to today's show. Today's episode of Another Dose will take a look at workplace violence in healthcare. We're excited to have two great guests with us. We have um, Chip Comstock, a fire chief and attorney from Ohio. And Robin, I'll let you introduce our second guest. This is Matt Streaker. He is a EMT and an attorney from New Jersey. And what else are you, Matt? Uh, I'm a lot of things, but none of it's <laughs> relevant to the podcast. So we'll just keep it at that. I'm a paramedic too. So. Paramedic, and I still I'm sorry. So that's okay. <laughs> well, we're excited to have both of you as we take a look at this topic. One thing that we know is that when it comes to healthcare workers, healthcare workers have a 20% um, higher rate of workplace violence than all other work workers. So it's important that we, we talk about this topic and, and kind of take a look at that. And some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to look at um, how effective leadership uh can help us to, to reduce workplace violence. We're going to talk about some of the risk by not paying attention to those things and not doing anything. We're going to look at some strategies to, to, to help keep our employees, our employees safer. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll dive into this conversation. So um, Chip, Matt, if one of you want to talk about what does OSHA say when it comes to workplace violence? Because I know there's a ton of guides and documents when it comes to um, being safe in the workplace. So it's funny, there's no specific workplace violence uh, OSHA standard yet. I would be willing to submit to you and to submit to everyone listening that the day is going to come when that's going to be an acknowledged thing. And it's not just healthcare. I mean, we always joke about the people who go postal because it was something back in the day when postal workers had that. But everyone in every workplace has a risk of violence against them. And and there's tons of uh, unfortunate uh, examples of people who go into work and don't go home because of workplace violence. So that, that's not endemic just to, to healthcare, but for our purposes for healthcare, um, I, I do think that this is a, a, a huge problem that we have to address. And in the absence of an actual OSHA standard, because I, I think what people do very often is they come in and they say, well, there's no OSHA standard, so we don't have to com- you know, comply with this. OSHA says we have to do blood for pathogens, and OSHA says we have to do respiratory protection, but OSHA doesn't say we have to do lifting and moving per se, so we don't have a lifting and moving standard. We don't have to train on that. That's not true. There's this thing called the OSHA General Duty Clause, and the OSHA General Duty Clause says that you have a responsibility as an employer to provide a workplace that is reasonably free of known workplace hazards. So it's hard to argue with a straight face at this point in 2020, almost 2021, that this is, any workplace isn't a risk of violence, but healthcare is not especially so. So how you provide a workplace that is reasonably free of threats of violence Depends on the workplace, depends on the threats, depends on the, um, the, the type of uh, environment that you're in. The, the, there's a million things that will go in the hopper when you analyze that. But at the end of the day, we can't just hang our hats on and say, well, there's no standard. We don't have to do this. There is overwhelmingly a standard. And just to kind of go back here, there's a case here in New Jersey that talks about the OSHA general duty clause as the primary um, cudgel, if you will, that OSHA used against a hospital for nurses being injured lifting patients. So kind of analogizing that, which is something that I think is something that we do need as well in the the EMS space and in the healthcare space, they use that to use the, as the primary standard to uh, find a hospital uh, wasn't meeting its duty to its employees um, in without a specific standard, they will certainly do that for workplace violence. Uh, Things that I've been running to, running into in the emergency department. So we get a lot of behavioral health patients. We get a lot of intoxicated patients. We get a lot of just mean in general patients. Um, I've had quite a few nurses and and other um, employees get injured because of these patients um, swinging at them intentionally. I have a nurse out right now because she got punched in the shoulders, unable to lift, has to go for an MRI, all kinds of things. Um, But my younger nurses are afraid to put in past reports or complaints about this. Uh, we had a 16 year old that came in that was high on something and she punched my nurse right in the stomach. And my nurse was like, well, she didn't know what she was doing. Well, yes, she did. And if we don't report these things, it's going to continue to happen all the time. So I, I just don't know where to go as a manager to educate them to say, we've got to, we've got to do something. I, I would submit to you that, that uh, an opportunity to, from up and down, left and right, across the organization, from the top of the organization to the front line, 
And in all the different facets from clinical to, to administration, you have to decide that this is something you're going to dedicate yourself to do. You know, we very, very quickly dedicated ourselves to COVID safety. You know, I, I submit that I, I don't think too many EMS providers had worn an N95 mask in January of last year a single time in their careers. I know all of a sudden that N95 mask is my bestest friend in the whole world. And I know my N95 mask like my rifle in the Marines. So, you know, if we put the effort in, it would take very, very little work to submit that, that we want to have a culture that is focused on this. And while I respect the nurse who doesn't know, or any provider for that matter, who mm -hmm. says, I don't think that this patient knew what they were doing. There's a case I'm thinking of in New Jersey where there was a hypoglycemic patient who smacked a, a paramedic in the face because she was altered. Um, I, I don't think that the patient should be criminally charged with that, but it certainly has to go down a measurable risk of violence mm -hmm. against providers because you had your face near a person who was altered, who punched you, who hurt you. So that has to be analyzed. Now, how do you root cause those and, and parse them down below that into ones that are preventable, ones that are you know intentional, ones that were not preventable, um, and, and how you seek to, to address the, the root causes and, and you know, improve upon that, you start to pull that data down lower. But at the top end of that, they're all acts of violence against our providers. They all have to be counted. So um, to expand on that, Matt, you brought up a great point. Um, one of the things that I do in my job is that we encourage our employees to report any type of risk, such as you know being struck or that, because it allows us to design physical security measures to keep our employees safe. If we don't know about things that are happening, we can't implement measures to keep them safe, whether that be more deterrence, more cameras, panic buttons, making sure there aren't objects in the room, um, practicing exit plans, increasing lighting. Scene lighting is a big thing we know, especially in EMS. Do we need to add extra you know, lighting on the ambulance, those kinds of things, um, two-way radio communication. But we can't look at and identify measures to put in place to protect our employees if they're not telling us what's happening. I'm a huge right. proponent of just culture. And one of the things that our firm teaches fairly regularly to people as a leadership issue and as a leadership skill is just culture, um, which I, I could not be a bigger proponent of. Um, but one of the big things that just culture measures is near misses, because it is those near miss events that you have to capture if you're going to catch them. I mean, at the end of the day, a near miss event and a risk event where you actually have one, the difference is luck. The risk of harm is the same either way. So, you know, if you have the near miss where you don't have a, a, a bad injury, um, that's but for the grace of God goes thee, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, and just let me throw one piece out on this. One of the things that I really think is an important piece of just culture for this is that safe harbor for reporting. And we culturally, and when I run just culture shops and we, we implemented it, we let everybody know there is absolute impunity for you reporting these events and reporting these near misses. And if you self-report, um, what we call category one and category two events in my system, which are you know the reasonable conduct, human error events, and the at-risk conduct events. And if you self-report either of those things, so you self-report anything other than intentional misconduct, which I don't know why you would self-report intentional misconduct, it's kind of axiomatic. But if you report any other conduct like that, you have a safe harbor against any action happening against you. No one will take action. That is a hard stop in my world. Um, and that encourages people to come forward and capture the data so that you can address the, the root causes and you can capture the amount of, of risk and stratify the risk and address the root causes and kind of go through that entire process. But absolutely think it's so important for this. Um, and, it, and it helps the culture too as well that you provide an organization and support for people where they don't feel like it's their fault. I think you find a lot of providers that get up in harm's way and at the end of it, they beat themselves up and they go, how the hell did I let myself get put in that position? Mm -hmm. you know? And, and, and not to say that there isn't a little bit of self-awareness and a little bit of self-criticality that's n that not inappropriate. I'm always my own worst critic at the end of the day and make sure that I'm doing right. Don't get me wrong. I'm all about making sure that you're striving to be good, but striving to be good and killing yourself over it are not the same things. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that kind of goes into the next thought that I had. And Chip, maybe you can uh, answer this for us. Um, uh, where's the liability on the employer to, you know, and as far as workers' comp um, and the employer's liability, as far as making sure that the employees are safe. Before I answer, let me give a quick um, uh, cover your butt uh, uh, note, and that is that we're, when we deal with laws, you know, all 50 states are different, and and there can be uh, nuances between New Jersey, Ohio, uh, Michigan, wherever else. So, uh, you know, we always say make sure you check with your local council just to see 
what that workers' comp liability may be or, you know, what the third-party liability may be. But again, getting back to, I, I agree that generally throughout all the states, we have a uh, general duty clause, which Matt outlined, and, and it's going to be somewhat case-specific because you're going to look at all the factors. So what's the, what's the workers' comp liability? You know, generally, workers' comp systems are, are no-fault systems, meaning that the employer pays for the injury uh, regardless of whether the employer was at fault or the employees at fault. So that goes back to Matt's point about sort of the culture and your point about reducing the risk. When we're looking strictly at workers' comp, what we want to do is improve our, our um, environment so that we don't have claims employees don't get hurt. So I, I think there's a lot of um, uh, teamwork that's required. And I, I was thinking as you all were going through that, that um, discussion about self-reporting, reporting things to the employer, and I thought, man, if, if an employer wanted to take action against somebody who is trying to improve the workplace, as a general rule, but I'm not sure that's a place I'd want to work in the first place because the culture there really isn't that healthy for me. I mean, I would think that the employer would want to take proactive action and reduce it. So if, I, if I'm reporting, say we have safety issues and they're taking actions against me for doing that, time to look for someplace else to work, to be honest. Here, here. Another great tool is that there's a thing called a physical security assessment that a physical security specialist can come in and do an assessment, whether it be your hospital or even your ambulance. I've done assessment of ambulance as far as where things are placed and locking things up that'll look at the risk and it'll identify some of those weaknesses and, and help you to mitigate that risk. So I encourage, you know, it's a good, a good thing to get done is the physical security assessment because then it kind of, it helps you to, to reduce that risk. And, and it looks at also what are some of those past things like Chip was just talking about, you know, that way you can get those fixed as well. Here. The other part is uh, the, the third party liability. And that kind of gets back to the same type of thing. When people come into your business in a hospital setting and, and they are uh, there for treatment and they get injured as a result of some other person's act, it, it, we, we're going to assume it's not the employee, it's somebody else coming in there. They're going to look at sort of a, the, the courts are going to look at the totality of the circumstances again and say, are you on notice? Is this a real problem in, in your hospital? We see people who come into businesses who are hurt as a result of a third party, and, and they're going to look and say, Were, was the business on notice of this potential risk? And if so, should they have taken some action um, to prevent it? And, and they're going to look and say, was the, and if they did take some action, was the action reasonable under circumstances? We were talking about, uh, you have the, the people, the problem people coming into the emergency room. Well, what is the hospital done to, to, when they're on knowledge that that's a regular occurrence, what have they done to uh, prevent harm to their, to their guests, to their patients? And is that action reasonable under the circumstances? And in many cases, courts may say that's a jury question to determine whether it was reasonable. And if that's the case, that, that employer or that hospital or that medical provider uh, is rolling the dice to, to f figure out what a, what a jury might do. Yeah, it, it's actually a great point. Um, you can't sue in most places if it's a workers' comp claim from a liability perspective. You know, if your hospital, Robin, one of your nurses gets hurt at work, he or she trades their medical care for the right to sue. So they don't have to sue the hospital because of that. That doesn't mean they can't sue other people. They can sue the guy or the gal who hit them, depending mm -hmm. on the circumstances civilly. Um, they can also sue third-party tort feasors, and there's always that possibility if there's a third party at fault. You know, if you had a company that was running your security, for example, and I don't want to, you know, impugn anybody's security, but if you have in-house security, that's one thing. But if you have an outside company providing your security and they fail to do that, you might have a third party claim against them, but you can't sue your employer in most places for this. So it's kind of a like the catch-22. I think a lot of employers are like, well, we don't have a lot of liability here because they can't sue us because of the comp, what we call the workers' compensation bar. Well, the comp bar is great, but it's not an absolute bar. So, and in some places, there are ways to pierce the workers' compensation bar. And again, they, you know, Chip totally hit it. These are really state-specific things. So every jurisdiction is different, and every law is different. Then find somebody, and I overwhelmingly think it's important, don't just talk to a regular lawyer. You need to talk to a lawyer who specializes in these areas when you have these types of issues come up. Um, you know, the, the guy or gal that did your wills or your trust or your family, your divorce, is not the folk you want to do this. So... <laughs> I think uh, one of the issues that we run into is that, you know, the, the staff will um, file a police report because we do have officers in the hospital. And then um, the 
the patient will get arrested, whether it's that day or days later, they go to their house and arrest him. And by the time it gets to court, it gets thrown out by the prosecutor because there was a medical condition. So they feel like they're doing all, the nursing staff is doing all of the right steps, but they get nothing out of it. Nothing happens to the patient who was the one that intentionally punched us or, you know, hurt us. So well, I don't know how to fix that, yeah. part, that part of it. I had a situation where uh, <laughs> I was upset with a patient because the patient set items in the hospital on fire. Okay, so mm. they wanted to prosecute the patient for setting the hospital room on fire. The problem was that the patient was in the mental health ward at the time. So mm -hmm. it's hard to have intent when we've already diagnosed you at the time that you don't have the ability to form the intent uh, there. And so given the uh, patient's condition, it may be difficult to prosecute. Getting back to the point that you know patients who come in who have mental health uh, episodes, and depending on the state laws, whether they're under the influence of some sort of drug, the prosecutors may say, we're not, we aren't going to take those cases. But that doesn't mean that the hospital shouldn't take into account those situations and prevent against them. I mean, I, I'm looking at how was it, in my case, how was it that the patient had the ability to set the room on fire, knowing that the, the hospital knew all these things about the patient. So when they're, when they're bringing the patient in and the patient is on drugs, has some other things, I'm saying, you're on notice when that patient rolls through the door, because typically the, the, um, uh, EMS staff is giving you the hospital a heads up. We have a vital patient. We have an overdose. We have this. We have a mental health patient we're bringing in. Ta da! Again, you're now on notice that you better take some sort of action. And, and those are, again, those are working with the hospitals to put them on notice. And I get back again, I think the greatest risk for hospitals in terms of liability is not going to be from the employee because, again, there may be limitations on the workers' comp. What happens when that that staff member, I'm sorry, the, the patient injures that third party. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the lawsuit's going to come, especially the more reporting that there's been of your staff members to a hospital about all these incidents, they're really on notice. And, and the more that, that that's being reported and the less action that the hospital takes, the greater the risk on a third party claim by some other patient. Mm -hmm. yeah. Robin, to your point, and I think you raised a really interesting issue, which is the unwillingness of a lot of law enforcement entities to prosecute these cases. Um, and I think there, you need to have a proactive dialogue with your law enforcement, with your local police and your local prosecutor, district attorney, whatever they're called within your jurisdiction, who handles prosecuting those cases. And you need to talk to them in advance. And it probably is above the level of the charge nurse above the level of the shift supervisor in EMS is probably like a leadership uh, engagement between the organizations. But I would think that someone from, and I'll just use your hospital as an example, your hospital's operational leadership, maybe nursing leadership, public affairs, public relations, and government relations, who does the lobbying and the government outreach, probably should be sitting in a room with the cops and with the prosecutor that says, listen, we get it when you can't prosecute somebody because they come in because they don't have the requisite mental status, what we call mens rea in the law. They don't have the requisite mens rea to prosecute this. And if they don't have intent, it's hard to prosecute. That being said, when they do, we expect you to prosecute these people, okay? If you prosecuted them as a cop, you're going to prosecute them against a nurse or a medic or whatever other healthcare provider they should be. And we want to open that dialogue now because we don't want to be on the news having a press conference at the dismissal because, and I'll tell you, I have a, a colleague whose wife was uh, assaulted and they ripped her hair out at the roots and literally like, you know, caused her very significant injury. Um, and she and her husband are both medics and they're both friends of mine. And there was a, a pretty significant intervention that had to happen um, where they were going to dismiss the case and they packed the courtroom with paramedics. And that's not the thing you want. Um, you really want to avoid the level of confrontation where suddenly the county prosecutor is says this sea of blue. You know, the cops do it. And I'm not in, you know, you know, faulting the cops. When somebody assaults or kills a police officer at that, in, in the arraignment hearing, you see a wall of blue in the back of the room. Mm -hmm. I get it. There's a reason for doing that. 
um, you could just as easily have a wall of nurses in scrubs or a wall of medics in you know medic uniforms or whatever else you got there. We would prefer not to have that happen. We would really like to address this with you guys because we're your partners and we think that there are ways to, to address these and when these things happen, have a, you know, a conflict resolution process so that it's just not prosecutorial discretion. We don't want to do this. It's not one of us, which is why I think a lot of law enforcement sees this. It's us who are the, the, the victims of this. So they kind of, they internalize it and personalize it. So because you as a nurse or you as a medic aren't one of us, they're not putting the same degree of, um, of gravitas associated with it. Um, I don't know that that's really what's driving it, but I think that that is often what the, um, the optics are, what the appearance is. So you can get rid of a lot of that stuff with an open dialogue with law enforcement in advance. Um, really don't want to leave that to the grassroots stuff. I mean, we're all here, we're doing this on podcasts, we're all on social media. Trust me, if you want to pack a courtroom with, with medics or nurses, it'll take me 20 seconds to post something on Facebook and I'll have a courtroom full of people. I'll have people live streaming it out there on Facebook <laughs> or some other thing. And those, those things, get, they go viral very, very quickly. Um, and people pick them up. You know, right. there was a, a case yesterday and I don't, I don't want to opine on the case um, because the facts of it really aren't relevant to what we're talking about here. But there was a paramedic in New York City who had an issue uh, and she was put up on the, uh, the New York Post and kind of shamed for what she had done on the New York Post. Um, and, you know, politicians, like the fairly well-known national federal politicians were weighing in on this and it became a big thing. You know, Twitter's a thing, guys. You know, if you noticed that, but in the year 2020, people get up, <laughs> you know, people get you know, people to notice things like that on Twitter pretty darn quick. So there's ways to do it, I would say the right way, and there's ways to do it the wrong way. And I think the right way is to go in proactively and open that dialogue and, and you know, short circuit those so your folk don't feel like they're not being respected and take actions into their own hands as a result of that. And a lot, I know here in Ohio, in, in most counties, we have um, police chief meetings, just like, you know, there's a fire chief meetings, which is a good opportunity for um, the EMS director or captain or, or somebody from the hospital to ask if they can go and speak at that meeting, get to know those chiefs and say, hey, here's some of the issues. What can we do to help, you know, bridge this relationship? And to I, I think Mm -hmm. That's the first step, but then getting, getting to Matt's part, I think the second part of, of that is, you know, if, that, if the police uh, or law enforcement charge that patient, right, with the assault, the concern is then that, they, that it either is going to or actually does get dismissed right. when it appears in front of a judge mm -hmm. uh, because the prosecutor has entered into an agreement with the defense counsel. Well, you know, he yeah. didn't have the, they make the argument, he didn't have the intent, et cetera, rather than taking on that case, taking it to trial, and maybe losing. But the fact of the matter is, on the county level, as you suggested in Ohio or anywhere else, most prosecutors are elected positions. So they not want to Jersey. have... Not in Jersey. Really? Oh, our wow. prosecutors are not elected here. We have, we have politicians. We have our prosecutors and our judges in New Jersey are politically insulated for exactly that reason. Hmm. Well, so. Here we are in Ohio, uh, and, and <laughs> for us, they're, they're elected. And so, again, whether you have that, you have that discussion with, the, with the, whether it's the police chiefs or you have it with a prosecutor, for that very reason, listen. You know, everybody's watching this case. We don't want there to be an issue. You want to have the, the support of our group. You know, you need to do that. So, um, again, I think to Matt's point, it is having that dialogue. You know, whether it's with elected official or not, let them know what what your view is ahead of time before we have that problem down the road. I think the other thing to point out is because we know when these cases do get dismissed, that it can lower employee morale. You know, they start to feel frustrated. Nobody's listening to them. I think it goes back to communicating to the employees and letting them know, hey, we're trying to do something. Here's what we're trying. We're trying to build these relationships, you know, letting the employee know that you're, you still got their back and, and you're trying to advocate. I think that goes a long way as well as you're kind of um, struggling through some of these barriers. Yeah, and I think if you set that up as a formal group, like a, a you know a committee, a conflict resolution process, whatever you've got, some kind of ADR, you set it up where that nurse or that medic, whoever it is, has a place to go internally to get redressed, to get it addressed, to go through a chain to get to the person who's actually got the, the control to do this, and they don't feel like they're prone to cast to the wind, and they don't feel like they have to take it upon themselves. So it prevents a lot of things. And, and the last thing we want in the world, and I don't want to disrespect law enforcement by any means. That's not my intent here. Thank um, you. Uh, no, but by all means, <laughs> being a prosecutor is a tough job. And prosecutorial discretion is a thing. And nobody wants to try every case. Um, you still want to keep a good working relationship. You know, when I'm a, I'm a medic in the field, I know that when I call, their cops are coming. 
And mm -hmm. I know that when they call, we're coming because that's the thing. We all have each other's backs there. So you don't want to erode that level of trust there. That's a, a huge piece to me going down the line. Chip, go ahead. I know you got some. Well, uh, to your point, again, to, as a follow-up to your point, I think that's one of the things we've talked about so far is the relationship and, and, and the, uh, the events occurring in a hospital or institutional setting. But we're also dealing with medics. And you know, those violent patients can occur out in the – you know, outside of the hospital, in fact, probably occur outside a hospital as much if not more as inside the hospital with respect to EMS personnel. And, mm -hmm. and that's where it's really critical. We talk about this ongoing dialogue with law enforcement. There, it's not only um, having that dialogue to assist us in charging violent patients, but more so working with them to, to prevent the, the harm to, the, to, the, to our uh, employees and to, and to um, you know, to EMS personnel. So, you know, how are you going to respond? How are you going to assist us? What can you do? Um, you know, we've had just making sure that uh, if there's a uh, medic in trouble, you know, everybody understands what's the secret code words for saying, hey, this person's in trouble. How are you going to respond? We have to, it's critical that we have those discussions in advance. And there's, quite frankly, in my department, we had some critical failures where we had not done that. And we need to sit down with our law enforcement, with dispatchers and and making sure that we had filled in those gaps. So I think that's something that we need to talk about as, as employers uh, of volunteer and paid personnel. How do we minimize the, the risk to our, our staff in the field? And then also how do we work with law enforcement to do that as well? No point, I, I, I wanna throw this out. Um, you know, I still practice, I'm still in the field, and I'm, I'm hoping that my employer is not going to be angry with me for throwing them out here right now, but I work at the Cherry Hill Fire Department as a frontline uh, per diem EMT, and the Cherry Hill Police Department, and I want to give them all the kudos in the world, not only do we routinely stage for violent encounters or psych patients or things like that and allow law enforcement to clear the scene and, and make sure it's safe for room before we go in, but the Cherry Hill Fire Department routinely will transport uncomplicated psych patients to crisis without EMS intervention. And they don't involve us. We go to the scene, we wait. And if we're not needed, because there's no medical emergency and it's a pure, uncomplicated psych call, they will actually take that patient uh, without escalating it, without it becoming anything significant and, and transport that patient and we become available and, and go handle other medical calls. And I, I tip my cap to them because they're extremely professional. They're wonderful to deal with. And in my experience, candidly, having 30 odd years of doing this, that's not the way most things go. Usually the other <laughs> way. Um, so yeah. you, know, you really can develop a really wonderful um, relationship with your law enforcement entity to handle things like that to where everybody's got their skills. They've got their... Um, you know, the, the focus on what's right and being patient focused, even if they're not patient care providers per se, because they're law enforcement, but doing what's right for that person at the time. Um, so they really are great ways to partner with law enforcement. And that's why I'm hoping that they're going to be okay with me throwing them out here. <laughs> Sherry Hill Priest does a phenomenal job there. I think it's important to know in, in the jurisdiction that you're operating in to know your response times and make sure that your newer EMS folks are familiar with that. I operate in a rural county and it can take up to an hour for us to get a deputy sheriff on scene. So yeah. there's a lot of times, yeah, so you know, so I think it's important that we educate, you know, our, our newer folks on what to do when they get into those difficult situations so that they're trained to understand. And, and that's, and again, getting back, getting to be proactive ahead of time. I think that's, you know, there are, uh, you read about counties and, and whether it's fire or medical providers who talk about the sheer distance of the areas they have to cover or the lack of supporting resources, uh, law enforcement being one that they have to basically say, hey, we're on our own. You know, we're out there, we don't have these other options. We're not the city that has you know, police around every corner. And mm -hmm. so the employer, uh, the organization needs to think about how they're going to handle those situations and have a policy to address it. And, and I know this wasn't necessarily on our topic, I mentioned it before we began, but one of the ones that I see that a lot of rule-based departments have talked about um, and some urban departments have as well, I should say some suburban departments, and that is it, um, equipping their personnel dealing with violent patients with, um, with weapons, uh, including, you know, including guns. You know, this is how we're going to address our violent patient. This is how we're going to handle the shooter. This is how we're going to do this. And, you know, that opens a, a whole nother can of worms uh, that, can make the employee, we, we said, you know, we're not going to get into, I know we don't want to go necessarily down that whole subject about 
you know, the, the employees having to deal with, um, with violent patients, you know, how they're going to handle it, we're focusing on how the employer handles it. But that, that I, I just want to say, as, as we're talking about those rural areas, and that is an area that, that I've been asked about, you know, dealing, how do we equip our, our employees? And I, just, I'll say universally, bad idea. And, right. And I think we talked about this before at, at FDIC, Chip, and my thought has been, you know, as a law enforcement professional, I'm trying to always keep a hold of my weapon. Well, if I'm doing compressions, I can't protect my weapon. So I can't be doing CPR effectively and protect that weapon at the same time. Yeah, you, can't, you can't maintain scene security. And, and I actually was at a department that encourages so people to have guns. So I, I had two of them do, who were wearing guns, you know, show me how they were doing compressions. And I walked up behind one of them, put my hand on the gun. And, you know, I mean, that's not a great move, but I said, <laughs> I just took your weapon. I just took your, I just took your weapon from you. Yeah. Uh, you're not able to protect it. Yeah, it, it's mm -hmm. funny. I, I'm not sworn. I'm not law enforcement. That's not my background at all. Um, but I've had many colleagues who are. Um, and a, a federal law enforcement officer was one of my medics where I used to be a chief officer. And we had this discussion. His point was exactly what you just mirrored, Candace, which is when you're law enforcement, you're keeping your weapon hand away from the patient, away from the other person. When you're doing medicine, it can't always be that way. And he did not arm mm -hmm. himself when he was on my ambulances, which was again would have been against state law, but because he's a federal law enforcement officer, I think he would have been able to, you know, throw the supremacy clause mm -hmm. in away with yeah. that one. But he chose not to, um, and I respect him for that because he, he, you know, was concerned about that. That being said, and and Chip, I think you, you know you raised this when we're in New Jersey, um, and I'm not saying that because we're a blue state versus a red state. Um, I'm saying that that for the most part in New Jersey, and that's not always the case. There are some places where in Jersey where you've got long law enforcement response time, but. You know, I was a medic, Candace, in South Carolina, where we had that 45-minute long response time for a law enforcement officer first two. There are places where it might be appropriate for you or more appropriate under the circumstances. And I don't want to, you know, cut the, you know, one-size-fits-all for any of this um, and, and say that I, I, I don't think it's a good idea across the board. I think, generally speaking, it's probably not a great idea to arm EMS providers because of the weapons retention issues and the skill degradation of, you know, making your, your shoot, don't shoot and, you know, being proficient in using your weapon and qualifying. There's a lot of things that go into that. Um, I'm not sure that the, the juice is worth the squeeze, candidly. I don't know that there's that many incidents of, of, of violence in, uh, against EMS providers. There are probably isolated ones, and don't get me wrong, but I think when you look at the, the spectrum of humanity, I think that there's not a lot of places where the use of deadly force by an EMS provider would have changed things. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, there may be, there may be other things. Um, you know, Candace, you and I were talking about a, a call that I ran a few weeks ago for a, a gentleman who was a patient with an overdose who was altered. Um, and before, and I had arrived before law enforcement on this call um, because it came in as an overdose, not anything where it was problematic. But I met the patient and very surreptitiously, I patted that patient down and made sure he was not armed before we got on my stretcher. Um, and, and my partner, who was a fairly new EMT, um, afterwards, I said, hey, do you see what I did there? And he goes, um, yeah, you helped him down the stairs. And I'm like, no, I frisked him for weapons. And my partner mm -hmm. kind of gave me, oh, I didn't see you. <laughs> Yes, I know you didn't. Then the patient didn't either, but I did. So, you know, there's, mm -hmm. there's, I, I'd rather honestly see more people frisk patients for weapons than I would see them armed, candidly. I think you'll right. save a lot more lives that way. But yeah. you know what? It might work in your system depending on the circumstances. And then you may live in Texas where it just doesn't matter because everybody's armed. So, right. <laughs> one, other, one other thing to your point that, that I always talk, talk about too, we talk about scene protection, we talk about you know, being professional with a weapon. The other thing with law enforcement is, they're, they're taught continuum of force. So you, you, you start off and say, listen, I, I can use joint locks. I can do this. I know how to do takedowns. Then I may have mace. I may have stun guns. I may have all these other options yes. that are available to me before I have to resort to the gun as a last resort. And when I see EMS or fire personnel talk about carrying a weapon, they're not talking about mace and learning tactics. Right. And they're not talking about all these other things. It's either I got to shoot or I don't shoot. That's my only choice that I'm given. So we're putting people even in a, in a bad position with that. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the other subject we talked about, if you're really worried about from an employer standpoint, and this may get back to, you know, how do we protect our employers, how do our employees, how do we protect ourselves? One of the things that I've seen some departments talk about is wearing the, the vest, right? We're going to wear a Kevlar vest, you know, bulletproof mm -hmm. vest, or it's going to prevent us from getting stabbed, punched, whatever. It's going to, it's going to provide that protection. And again, that comes down to some looking at the risk benefit analysis. You know, what is really our history here? Is it a real risk? Is it worth the expense? We, you know, we're going to weigh that because again, 
it's not cheap and we have to keep up with the standards or expiration dates. So we, we the, the employer has to make that, that decision. Um, how do we protect our personnel? Is that a viable alternative to trying to say we're gonna arm them? It's gonna provide some increased level of protection. Um, the one thing that we always talk about, and Candace, you know, I've had that discussion on vesting. All vests are not the same size. <laughs> right, right. So you're going to have to you're going to have to fit it for personnel. But here's the other thing: we always have we have a discussion uh, for employers or employees. When do you wear a vest? And like, well, we're for going into a dangerous situation, right? If we, and, and and the comment is, well, listen, if every paramedic who or, or EMS personnel, every every fire personnel who got shot or stabbed knew that they who had a vest knew they were going to get stabbed they probably would have worn it yeah you know it's most of the situations you, you don't know so we always say listen you're going to have a vest you're going to provide it the policy is you wear it on every call it's like wearing a seatbelt you don't know when you're going to get in an accident so click it right so it's mm -hmm. the same same analogy yep. closest i ever came to dying was not a shooting or a stabbing or anything like that closest i ever came to dying was in a single wide trailer in south greenville south carolina on a call for a cva and the call went sideways on us and that was the closest uh, I ever came to dying on a call. And, you know, if you're wearing your vest on the shootings and the stabbings, you're not going to wear it into a CBA. So I'm completely with you. It's all or nothing with that. So. Uh, and I want to, I just want to, the same thing, like reinforce that because um, I've been, had a gun pulled on me. I've had a knife pulled on me and I've faced an IED, but guess what? It wasn't in my law enforcement job. It was in my EMS role. There you go. Um. So I guess as we look at this, what are some tactics, you know, Chip, uh, uh, Matt, as you're out there practicing in the street, what are some, some best things that our providers can, can equip themselves as far as uh, mentally, you know, what, what can they do while they're on scene to keep themselves a little bit safer? Situational awareness is number yeah, one. That was number one. <laughs> <laughs> my number one, same thing like what I taught my, my partner the other day and patting the patient down. Um, and I'll tell you, but Candace, if there was one thing I would train every EMS provider and probably every healthcare provider too, um, and I'm going to be super honest here, and I'm going to speak truth to power because I've been doing this for a long time and I get to do that now. Um, most of the call, not all of them, but a good number of calls where EMS providers get in trouble, their mouths write checks their bodies can't cash. Mm -hmm. And they, they do things that they probably shouldn't be doing and say things that they shouldn't be doing. And I see you all smiling and nodding because we're all talking the, the underbelly of EMS here, which is sometimes your mouth is what gets you in trouble. If there's a class I would rather see above any other class for anything for self-protection, I want to see a verbal judo class. Yes. I want to see every healthcare provider talk on verbal de-escalation techniques. That is the thing that is going to save more lives than any handgun is ever going to. I'm sorry. Any, you're going to verbally de-escalate this stuff. It's going to save you. It's going to save the patient. A, a million percent. Um, I don't work in the ED. Um, I'm not going to opine on, yeah, you know, ED providers maybe, you know, having similar issues with that or not mm -hmm. in the field. I'm going to tell you that it, it happens and, you know, we, we do bad things sometimes and our, we, we run our mouths. Um, I, I would probably be willing to say that the ED staff could, for, for a, you know, a multitude of reasons, uh, benefit from a verbal judo or verbal de-escalation just as mm -hmm. much. So. Absolutely. I completely agree. Um, you guys only have the patient for a short period of time, though, and sometimes we have them for hours and hours and days. And, you know, listening to that, listening to them degrade you and swear at you and call you horrible names, people react after a while. And it's very, very difficult not to. But, but you know, we do take some, some classes on that. But, you know, it's part of situational awareness. And, and it's hard when you're put in that position to... to run into the situation to, to understand the situation that you are you know that self-awareness that this person's getting to me and I need to walk away mm -hmm. it took me a while you know my, my kids used to give me a hard time one in particular and, and you know I <laughs> started getting angry and I'd start this is you know the easiest thing for me to do is just step out of the situation you know take a mm -hmm. deep breath and come back and deal with it and, mm -hmm. and I think you know sometimes with patients we're not in a position that we could just you know leave them but it's, you know, it, it may be as simple as saying, listen, I'm getting a little upset, but my partner's pretty good. Let's have my, you know, switch the people who are, who are dealing with that patient at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I, I, you know, I've been in that situation with patients where it starts escalating and, and um, with age, I've learned to, to, you know, have somebody else take over sometimes where I'm, I'm dealing with somebody. And I, a couple of times I, I really was getting frustrated. I remember I had an automobile accident with a, with a spouse who showed up. 
and was really interfering with what we needed to do. And I was starting to get angry. And I just, you know, I was able to grab a police officer and say, you know, you deal with this person because I'm getting, I'm getting really upset with that, that person you know, was we're trying to get our work done. Um, yeah. So I think if, you know, not only aware of the, the physical situation, what other people are doing, but that, that self-awareness of what, you know, we're doing. Yeah, and Chip, I would qualify that as in your miss, honestly. If you're at the point where you will reach a, a place with a patient, where the patient has gotten that bar under your skin that you and them are jawing at each other, and it's escalating, and you need to tap out and let your partner, it is absolutely the right thing to do. Bring your partner in, de-escalate the situation, go drive the bus, go do something else. Completely the right thing to do. But that, to me, is a reportable event for a near miss for a threat of violence because that goes the other way and somebody steps into somebody's face instead of stepping away from them and that becomes mm -hmm. and it escalates and it triggers and next thing you do people are throwing punches and that's how those things happen is you know you get jacked up you get your adrenaline you you know you tunnel vision in and you know and we're not trained on how to manage our own emotions on how to de-escalate that stuff and there's the dog um <laughs> sorry <laughs> Thanks, nope, there was a really cute little dog interruption there. So my, my cats have left me mercifully alone for this uh, podcast, which they, they don't know what to do. So. They were locked out, but my son let them all in, and now they're attacking me. Yeah. <laughs> Crap. They're just asleep, so I figured they were like laying here. Let's become a part of it. There you go. Yeah, oh, there she is again. <laughs> I, love I love it. it. True awareness. Yeah, I think those are great tips. So verbal judo is something that we're required to take at work. All of our, our officers are required to take. And it is, it's your first line of defense. And I love what you guys said about mm -hmm. tapping out. There is no shame in mm -hmm. saying, hey, I need to walk away. And I think that's something that we really need to stress to our employees. Let them know, hey, if, if this person um, gets under your skin, it's okay to walk away and let someone yeah. else step in. I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if verbal judo is like a trademark class where it's like a thing called the verbal judo, capital V, capital J. And if that's the thing, I don't want to endorse verbal judo. Oh, for I've heard somebody speak on that and it's great. Um, I, it needs to be any kind of verbal de-escalation techniques class. Verbal judo is probably a fine one for that. But just to be clear, any class like that that would serve that purpose to me would be the thing that would be the, the most uh, in, in, in incredibly valuable class and probably to be candid valuable for general patient stuff as well because there's lots of times when your patients are agitated and your patients are jacked up and they don't want to go to the hospital and it's not a violent encounter or a potentially violent encounter but if i can convince you know somebody whoever they are to go to the hospital when they would not otherwise and seek care that's a win 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 because that's across the board now now it's not even a violent thing now this is purely just patient focused doing good patient care so yeah, no, I, I think that you're absolutely spot on with that. I think, you know, those de-escalation tactics, being able to use our words to make the situation manageable, it's so important. Yeah, and the physicality of it too. I mean, like there's that like 80-20 rule of, you know, and I think it's like a 40-30-30 rule of how much comes off in your words, how much in your tone of voice and how much in your physical posture and your, your you know, when you're like mm -hmm. quiet with somebody, but you're puffing your chest out and you're, you know, angry person and you've got that authority thing going, you've got your vest on and you got your hands hooked into your vest here like this, it kind of shows, you know, and when you come up and you have a way of, of holding your body too. So it's a lot, it, it, verbal judo is a piece of this, but I think there's all of these de-escalation techniques that go into um, making our patients more comfortable with us in general on what is typically their worst day of the world when they call mm -hmm. 911 for something. And then on top of that, protecting ourselves um, and, and you know, providing an environment of care where we are much less likely to be injured by our patients. Absolutely. Absolutely. You guys have brought up so many good points. I just want to give you guys kind of a, a final opportunity to share any uh, words of wisdom mm -hmm. before we close out tonight. So uh, uh, Matt, we'll start with you. Oh, I'm going to get to go first. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I think this is something that everybody needs to take seriously. And I think it's that it's not on a lot of radar screens. And right now it's the end of 2020 and we're all looking down the, the light at the end of the tunnel of getting a vaccine um, and maybe coming out of COVID in 2021 and taking a giant deep breath and regrouping. Um, and this is not, I don't think, on a lot of main radar screens right now. I think that this probably would have been a year ago. And now all of a sudden, our priorities have completely been pushed off. And like, it is all COVID all the time for everything. And I'm not diminishing that. It's, it makes a lot of sense. But we're going to come out the back of this at some point, And we're going to have to, you know, figure out 
where we spend our budget money and where we spend our time and how we take people who are already burned to a crisp from dealing with a year of COVID and dealing with all the COVID hell. Um, and, and I want to be completely clear, like I have done a very small amount of COVID patients. I'm a per diem EMT working once every two weeks. I'm doing this much of what other people are doing this much. And my hat is off to everybody who's doing this full time right now. Um, but we look at what they're doing and we're going to have to keep them in the workforce. We're going to have to make the environment of care a little warmer and fuzzier than it was before COVID. It's going to change what people's expectations are. I don't know if you're seeing it, but there are people that are tapping out of the workforce in healthcare in general, EMS and hospital, they both. So that being said, this is these safety issues, these workforce retention issues are all going to be big things. About a year from now, we're going to see that like burst up into the community and be a thing we have to do. All right. Thanks, Matt. In, uh, in conclusion, I, I was thinking, how would I describe what shortly what we've been talking about? And I think ultimately it's a communication and feedback issue. You know, we, we talked about, you know, reporting the incidents so we can, we can have good data, developing policies and procedures to address the situations based on the information and reporting we have, and then getting feedback, whether those, um, uh, policies and procedures are, are working to protect our personnel, to protect our patients, and, and, um, you know, and ultimately to protect our employers and the business. So I think we just need to get, uh, have a lot of communications, you know, whether it's with staff, with um, our constituents, with law enforcement, with the prosecutor, and work, you know, identifying these problems and continue to work on them. And, and I agree with everything Matt's talked about with where we're going to be um, and looking at uh, potential safety issues down the road. And as you and I have talked about, the next thing is dealing with COVID and our staff is going to be, are those vaccines mandatory at the workplace? Stay tuned. <laughs> another, another great topic. They aren't for us yet, but they're recommended. Yeah, I don't know of any place, candidly, just you know, to, to hit that. I don't know of any place locally that is mandating the vaccine. They're all strongly recommending it. Um, but I don't know any workplaces that are mandating. And I think legally they may be able to, but right now no one's taking that step. I think there's a lot of reticence to people to take it. And that would probably have a rebound effect that would be pretty pretty dramatic, I think, in your workforce if you started to, to force that issue. So um, that being said, all of my friends who work in you know healthcare safety, vaccine safety, medical device safety are 100% on board with this. So, and those are the people that I trust, you know, my, my friend is a toxicologist who works for Johnson & Johnson and product safety says it's a safe to take. Mm, you know what? It's her or Google. Mm, I think I'm going to go with her. <laughs> so. oh, Dr. Google. Dr. Google. <laughs> so, Shit, this is a lot of fun. Thank you again. It's great working with you on these. It's so much fun. I've never met you, um, but I can't wait to, to be in the same room with you and, uh, and shake your hand because we've, we've, we've you know, come to be doing these, these cool podcasts together. Well, the, the, the best thing about when you and I get together it's likely that Candace is going to be there too, and she's buying the drinks. Oh my goodness! Oh, okay. Hey, where do I fit in here? You get the second round. <laughs> oh, no. oh, all right, <laughs> love it. No, this is this is a lot of fun, and I want to thank uh, you know Candace and Robin for inviting me aboard here. Um, this is the second time we've done this. I love doing these things. I love uh, you know if if any moment for any of us, we can turn the needle just a hair with provider safety, with you know better environments of care for our patients, and for better workplaces for our uh, our colleagues. If if one person gets a little bit better of a workplace for what we just did for an hour, then this has been a great hour for me. So thank you guys so much for letting me be a part of it. Oh, thank you guys for being here with us. I mean, the last few, we've gotten some feedback from people and um, it was great. So, you know, little things, like you said, one person, one person can do a, a, a whole lot to educate other people. Yeah. There's a great proverb that says, uh, a, one, a person who saves a life has saved the whole world. I like it. So, if you save mm -hmm. one person, you save the whole world. So. Love it. I love it. Love yep. it. We'd like to once again thank our guests and listeners for being with us today. I'm Robin Goldinger. And I'm Dr. Candace McDonald. Thanks for listening to Another Dose. Until next time.